Uh, hello guys, welcome back to John's Workshop and in this video we're going to go back on to the mill head refurb and if this is the first video you see in this series please go back, this is part 4 go back and check out parts 1, 2, 3 and 3B to give you an idea of what we're up to but just as a quick recap we have purchased a new ISO 30 spindle that I want to put into the mill we've added a rigidity ring on the underside of the head for that to fit into and we came to reassembly and the rack itself on the new quill was 20 thou plus half a millimeter plus on the existing rack therefore when I came to put the pinion shaft back in that connects to the hand wheel that controls the the downward and upward movement of the quill I could not get this to mesh so this job is all going to be on the milling machine. I'd originally planned to machine the rack on the shaper once I got the shaper rebuilt. I've decided against that following some really good comments and some more thought process. So I've decided this more simple way to do this is to machine the pinion. I've got a set of gear cutters. I've recently made a gear cutter arbor. So we've got all of the gear that we need. So we're now going to move to the mill and we're going to get this set up and we're going to have a go at recutting the pinion shaft so that I can get it to mesh. So, and I'll bring rather than do the details here, I'll bring you in at the machine and talk about how we're going to do that. Okay, <clears throat> so let me walk you through what I've done. So I'm, I'm not showing the setup in this video, but I'm going to quickly talk through it. So I've got my dividing head bolted down to the table, and what I've done is I've switch my spindle over so I've taken my Morse taper 4 spindle out that did fit the you know the rack and pinion meshed okay I've inserted my ISO 30 spindle and the only thing that's holding that in just now is the spindle lock itself so it's locked up and I've also wound the key bolt as hard as I can into the side of the spindle so it's pretty well where it needs to be it's not going to move I've obviously got no quill movement so I'm going to have to do everything in the z-axis using the head for what I need to do to machine this rack and this is the actual rack out of the machine so th there's no rack in the machine at the minute at all and this was a good tip from a good friend Dave Tyshurst and I'd not even thought about it and Dave said why don't you switch your spindles over machine this using your ISO 30 spindle your new one and then you can machine the rack and you can take it out try it trial fit it if it's not right you can whip it back out again put it back in set it back up and machine a bit more and do a bit of an iterative process until you get it right which was something that I'd not even thought about so fantastic tip Dave thank you very much so that's what we're going to be doing so we're set up we've got our tail stock in I've run my new ISO 30 spindle in because I've put all new bearings in that so that's had a good hour and a half of running in through all the speeds monitoring temperature as best I can just by hand I think everything's okay so and we're only going to be running slow RPM with this anyway so more than happy the spindles running enough to do this job so next thing about setup obviously dividing head on tail stock in place how have I set this up obviously we're clamped into a 3 jaw chuck in the dividing head I've worked out there's 14 teeth on this pinion so I've worked out what my divisions need to be on the dividing head and I'll just quickly show you that there's two ways to do that an easy way and a mathematical way so I'll show you I've used the easy way for this particular application and I'm not going to explain the more complicated mathematical way I'll probably do that in a tips video or something in the future so what's important here is this pinion is parallel to the table surface this way it's square to the machine's x-axis or parallel to the machine's x-axis this way and also concentricity wise it's running concentric to the rotation of the dividing head so they're the three main checks so I, I can bring you in and show you all three of those on this clock and I'll show you how we've got this set up. Okay, so a little bit first about the dividing head. 
in terms of my indexing I need to do for the 14 teeth that are on the pinion so how I've done that is I've gone in you know, this is the book that came with my dividing head and they've made it very easy for me in this particular book there's a table at the back with all sorts of different division uh, for a 1 to 40 worm and if I'm if I go and look at 14 which is there so that's 14 teeth that tells me or 14 divisions that tells me I need to use a 49 hole plate and my divisions are two full turns and 42 49 so 42 of the 49 holes is what I need to be going plus two full turns between each tooth so nice and simple so as I said done that the easy way I've marked that up on the top of my dividing head so that I don't forget because I've still my sector arms to set so I'm, when, we, when we're ready to go I'm going to set these sector arms up for my 42 49 but you can see there I've got two full turns and 42 49 so all set up I'll bring you in at the clock now at the DTI and show you the concentricity and, and setup that I've got parallelism wise to the axis okay we'll show you our concentricity first so I've got my DTI stylus roughly on center line and then as the teeth pass it will lift up onto the crest of the tooth for each tooth so if we do that now I've got minimal weight on the clock so we're plus 10 microns there roughly on that tooth plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 same same plus 10 0 minus 10 0 minus 10 0 and then we start going back to plus again so largely I've got 30 microns eccentricity <coughs> on this where, where I'm actually going to be cutting the gears I have checked it further out both ends but the important bit is this bit and also what I've not talked about yet this OD here which is largely clearance that well it is clearance the OD of these teeth is absolute clearance I've already had that on the lathe and I've skimmed the OD of these teeth down by the amount that I'm going to need to take off the pinion gear so that then when I'm done the pinion teeth are all in uh, sort of balance with each other and I've got the correct amount of clearance on the tips of the teeth so I've, I've done that off camera dead simple loaded it up in the lathe clocked it a bit like I've just shown and then turned the tips of the teeth down so that's now that I know that my tip clearance is correct I've just got to machine the tooth profile to the right depth so I'll reset the clock in fact I'll leave the clock where it is we're on we're on one of the marks there so we're on one of the teeth I can now just move my x-axis along along the length of the along the length of the tooth you can see we've got next to nothing in fact probably not even a couple of microns if that movement of parallelism on my x-axis and I'll not show it but I've got exactly the same going across the top so this couldn't really be set up much better than it is so I'm happy with that next job now is to get our gear cutter loaded in onto my new arbor into the spindle and then we're going to start trying to line the gear cutter up with this and getting the alignment the you know the circumferential alignment correct for the first tooth getting everything locked off getting my DRO set and then we can start having a go at cutting this and see what happens okay <clears throat> gonna show you now how I'm setting this up on centerline so I've got my cutter loaded in my new arbor that's all set up in the spindle ready to go so what I now need to do is put the center line on the cutter on the center line of the splines and because this is already splined it's not particularly easy I could set off one of these other diameters but I've done all my clocking off the spline area and I also want to do my setup of the cutter off the spline area so I'm keeping all the setup local to the splines themselves so what I've done is I've made up a slip pile and I've got that underneath the splines 
and I've just got a feel there and as I've rotated the rotary table round and checking and checking and I've just got a really nice a really nice feel there on the underneath of the splines all the way along nice feel under there so I know what the distance is well it doesn't really matter I don't measure the distance from the underside to the table that's unimportant all I know is this slip pile the top of that is coincident with the underside of the splines in this setup the next thing I've done is I've used a 0 to 1 micrometer and I've measured the thickness of my gear cutter which is just off camera apologies for that but I hope you can just see I'm just measuring the thickness of the gear cutter there which is 7.25 millimeters and I've also used another micrometer to measure the overall diameter across the splines which is 31.07 millimeters so basically I've taken 31.07 and divided it by 2 which gives me the radius of the spline diameter I've taken my cutter th width and divided that by 2 which gives me 3.625 and now what I'm going to do is bring the cutter down until I get a feel on top of that slip pile on the underside of the cutter so that's the next job I think you should be able to see the cutter come into view very shortly I've got my DRO switched on just put that over a bit so I can get the slips onto the onto the plain portion of the bed just going to gently lock up my head so I've just got a, a feel there on the slips so I'm going to zero my z-axis out and I'm now going to wind up my resultant which is 11.91 millimeters So that should have put us bang on centre line. So we're just going to wind in, have a quick look at that. It certainly looks like it's on centre. So what I now need to do is adjust the dividing head until my the profile of my gear tooth lines up exactly with one of the teeth and you're not going to be able to see that because I'll need to get the camera right in line which is going to be where I'm stood so I'll get that lined up off camera and then I'll bring you back when we're powering up we're taking a tiny touch on and then we're taking our first skim out of the first tooth and we'll see how we get on okay we've got our rotational position as good as I think we can get it and we've come in and we've just touched on and we've set our DRO in the Y axis to just that touch on point. Now I know I need to take half a millimetres radially out of this which is obviously 0.5 of a mil. I don't know whether, so that's what I measured the difference in the two racks so I'm just going to go for the half a mil probably just under before I check it for the first time. So I don't know this is quite unsupported where I'm actually cutting in the middle here and this is quite tough it's not hard but it's tough so I'm going to be going very steady for a start just to see what this feels like so I'm probably going to put 0.1 of a millimeters on so I've got my DRO zeroed out so I'm going to go for 0.1 which is four thou just over 0.11 and we're just going to take a pass down there and I need to set my X up when I get into the bottom of the cut so that I'm not ploughing into the 
that so I've got my zero set in my X so we're going to use that 0.1 cut going to run very slow so here we go we'll give it a shot and see what happens Well, that was nice and safe. I moved the y axis the wrong way. Shall we do all of that again? Clown. I'm trying to get a level of confidence of how much I've took off and so I started off trying to balance two three mil rolls in the equal and opposite gaps I was really struggling with that to get consistent measurement so what I'm doing now so this is the this is obviously the tooth that I've cut and I'm now measuring across the top of that roll to this diameter here at the end and the problem I've got is the three mil rolls I need to be three mil to get down into the right portion of the flank of the teeth to measure to get a decent measurement if I go four mil rolls or three and a half mil rolls it's it, that I need to protrude the outside diameter so I can just measure straight over the top I'm not locating in the right portion of the thread so a three mil roll is actually subsurface um, so what I'm doing is taking some measurements so I've taken a measurement this way across the, you know on the tooth that I've cut and I've moved the three mil roll and stuck it in one of the teeth that I've not cut and taken a measurement again that way measuring between the top of the roll and the underneath of this plane diameter here and I'm measuring about 0.25 difference even though I've wound half a million and I think the errors are either in the geometry of what I'm doing here or the fact that I, there could be some slight out of alignment with the way I've got it set up but I don't think 0.25 of a mil is going to be enough to make this mesh so I'm going to be brave and I'm going to trust my measurements I'm getting from the micrometer and I'm going to wind another 0.25 mil in until I can physically measure half a mil difference between this roll to the diameter and a one that I've not cut to the diameter at that point I'll know what my depth is and I'm going to do them all to that same depth going working to the DRO so and I think that's probably the best I can do with this with the stuff that I've got in the workshop what I don't want to do is undercut it not, you know, not take enough off and then strip it all down test it and find that I'm a country mile out it really doesn't feel like I've taken enough material off that at all so I'm going to be brave trust the measurements and see where we end up right I've re-measured and <laughs> I'm still not happy I put another quarter of a mil on to get me to where I thought I needed to be and it's actually measuring that I've taken about 0.12 off so and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm lost now. It's kind of taking half off what I'm dialing in, so I'm starting to get a little bit concerned. So I'm going to leave it at that three quarters of a mil position on the DRO in terms of depth, and I'm going to do all of them like that 
and then we're going to take it off and try it because there's some I don't know there's some weird function of the geometry going on I think that I'm not quite understanding so rather than cut too deep and scrap it I can always set it back up so the next job now is to index for the first time to the second teeth second tooth I've got my sector arm set so it's two full turns and 42 holes on a 49 plate so I've set the sector arms seven holes apart so I'm going to do two full turns back to my hole that I'm currently sat in and then a third turn round to the bottom sector arm will get me those 42 holes so we do that now so there's one full turn two full turns and I'm going to be going into the hole that's at the bottom of the sector arm there locking the dividing head up and then moving the sector arms round which is easier said than done are a little bit stiff on here and now I'm set up for my next index so I'm just going to run a few more teeth off and I'll bring you back when we get somewhere near the end okay we're on the final cut we've stopped fanning around with this so we're we're going a bit quicker now we've got a bit of experience so we're all set up for the last cut Well, guys, it's a bad day in John's workshop. I don't know if you can see this on the camera or not, but if you look at the width of the land at the top of the gear, as I go around all the teeth, it doesn't take a mastermind to spot what's going on here. And you can see there's a stark difference in the lands at the top which just caught my eye as I was visually inspecting it so what's happened there then? the very simple answer to that the clown that set the dividing head up whilst he was trying to get 42 holes on a 49 plate decided that there was 7 holes difference therefore set the sector arms to a 7 hole gap where he should have set the sector arms to an 8 hole gap rather than a 7 hole gap so what's happened is I've indexed the part too far by one hole on every index all the way around and obviously as you get back to your first tooth which is probably this one you end up with a really thin tooth because we've got incremental errors all the way around the shaft so excuse my language I don't often swear on here but I've balls that right up so what does all that mean well John very smugly thought not a problem because I've got a spare one of these so that will call that one a practice part and we'll have a proper go paying a little bit more attention next time around and again it doesn't take a, a genius to see that those two parts look distinctly different and they are because on this one this bit where the gear teeth are has been case hardened to a degree or induction hardened sorry to a degree so I am not going to cut that with a high speed steel gear cutter so what does all that mean I will I will edit out the bad words <laughs> that's what it means lots of bad words it now means I've got a mill that I can't use with either my ISO spindle or my Morse taper 4 spindle because like an idiot yeah I'm not going to say what I'm thinking 
So, how do we rectify that? Well, there's only really one way to rectify that, and that's make a whole new one of these. Or buy a whole new one of these, which I'm not going to do, because I've got a machine shop, and therefore, I will pay the penalty for not paying enough attention, and I will order some material in to make a new one of these. So that's going to be an upcoming project. So with all of that being said, and once I've calmed down, I will join you back at the board, and we will close this very sad and dire episode out. Well, there we go, guys. Still smiling. <laughs> that's all you can do. And I've just altered the word slightly at the bottom of the board there to reflect our current situation. So, what does all that mean? I know I keep saying that. <laughs> what it means is, is there a lesson in this video? Yeah, there's a big lesson in this video. Who for? For me, and uh, hopefully for you as well. And I think the lesson for, for you guys, certainly the, the home hobby shop guys amongst you that have not had the sort of training and experience and industry experience that I've had, which makes me very ashamed to say that when I do things like this, but the lesson there is we're all human and we all make mistakes. So I think, you know, and it, I think it's good to show mistakes when they happen. I do try and do that. And, and if I ever make mistakes, you know, if they're big clangers like this, I will show it um, because I think that's probably more valuable to the home hobby shop guys. There's, there's, there's a lot of uh, videos and creators on YouTube that just make the perfect part every time without any explanation and everything's wonderful and yeah the, life's not like that <laughs> in this game life is really not like that one simple mistake one hole out on the on the plate not thinking not paying enough attention and that's the result so the lesson I guess is you know even people with trained experience can make mistakes so therefore if you make a mistake yourself as a home hobbyist, don't be too hard on yourself. Uh, I will use the word life happens um, instead of the word that I want to use. So, yeah, I, I guess the lesson there is just, you know, the, 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 the reaction to all of this is get up and go again, you know, and, and fix it. That's what we're all about. That's why we're machinists and engineers and that's what we do. We fix things. Or in this case... <laughs> we properly fix things so um yeah still laughing um it's one of those things and apologies this episode's not really been what it was designed to be there's no point in me trying to rectify it in the space of a couple of days that i've got until this needs to go out so i'll just show it as it is hope you've uh <laughs> hope you've enjoyed following along with that little faux pas and um we will catch up with this project at a point in the future when i've got some material ordered and it's turned up and you know overall I think it will make a, a, a good little project and some, some nice turning work to do between centres and then back on the mill to mill the gear from solid from scratch uh, rather than trying to pick up on a gear that already exists and uh, yeah so uh, a future project uh, and hopefully we'll get it right I'm going to order enough to make two or three <laughs> based on this experience so we'll uh, we'll do that at a point in the future. So, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed that, such as it was. Thank you, you know, for subscribing. Thank you to the new subscribers that have come along. And we'll catch you all very soon on another video when who knows what on earth we'll be doing. <laughs>